Who has a super dope tat artist? You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble. This is the second pod for today. Uh, back on a regular schedule now that I'm uh, back from overseas. So uh, the, the shows I'm recording on the day that we're actually going to be releasing them. This is the second one for today, which is uh, Wednesday. And that is the, uh, I think it's Wednesday. No, it's Thursday. I've even got my days mixed up. We're looking at the Indiana Pacers. Let's get straight into that. And to talk about the Indiana Pacers, I am joined by my basketball monster colleague. And that is Greg Ehrenberg. As Greg runs in, we realize this could get dangerous. Yeah. And I could hear the drops now. Perfect. So, yeah, I think it's good to get you straightened out and back from vacation, Josh. And we have the Pacers to talk about who were predictably part of what was maybe the most lopsided trade in the NBA last season. <laughs> yep, definitely. They uh, they cleaned house uh, with the Oklahoma City Thunder. And, of course, we say that partially in jest because Paul George is a great player. But nobody could have predicted the Pacers to come out of it at this level of success, finishing 48-34, and 34, good for fifth seed in the Eastern Conference, taking the Cavs to seven games and realistically probably should have been able to knock them off despite, uh, despite LeBron James, who, who carried the Cavs over the line. They were fantastic. Fantastic um, last season, in large part due to Victor Oladipo realizing all of his potential and perhaps a, a little bit more that we didn't necessarily expect him to get to. We'll get into all the individual players soon. Just a quick overview of this team. I mentioned they won 48 games. They do have the 23rd and 50th pick in this upcoming draft, so not necessarily difference makers there, but adding some rotation pieces at least at pick 23 will be what they're looking to do. And in terms of free agency, there's uh, Thad Young, who has a player option. The recent reports are that he's looking to decline that and maybe get himself a couple of extra guaranteed years on the, uh, on the market. His contract is for $13.8 million for this upcoming season, so he might be back. He may not. Then we've got a team option on both Mighty Joe Young and Lance Stevenson. Lance for $4.4 million, Mighty Joe Young for $1.6 million. Um, Trevor Booker and Glenn Robinson, both on minimum contracts, are unrestricted free agents. And then a bunch of non-guaranteed guys. Boyan Bogdanovich at $10.5 million. Al Jefferson at $10 million and Daza Collison at $10 million. Now, I would assume that Collison and Bogdanovich will be back for this team. I would be absolutely flabbergasted if Al Jefferson returns on that $10 million. Now, not all of that is unguaranteed, but they will almost undoubtedly take the hit and get rid of him. E.K. Anabogu and Alex Poitras are both non-guaranteed as well, while Ben Moore uh, is a restricted free agent after being a two-way guy last season. So there is some um, ability to to cut some salary with Jefferson there. Maybe they want to go all, all in and, and remove Bogdanovich and Collison and have if Thad declines his option and they decline Lance's option. So they could open things up. I just don't think they'll necessarily uh, do any of that. Thad Young, what would you... um? Say he declined the option, Greg. What would you? Uh, what sort of contract would you be looking at offering him? Well, let's see. So right now, the player options for thirteen point seven million. If I'm the Pacers, though, also what's a Thad Young, twenty nine years old. If I'm the Pacers, I would really like to see what happens if they play uh, Sabonis more minutes next to Miles Turner. We didn't really see a lot of that last year, and it wasn't really super successful when it happened. But Given the age of Thad Young at 29 years old, I probably wouldn't want to give him a really long-term contract. I think maybe like three years, $45 million is in the neighborhood of what I would be looking to offer him. I wouldn't want to give him more years than that, especially because I don't think he's the type of player who would age extremely well. He's not a great perimeter shooter. He's very reliant on athleticism. And at 29 years old, I kind of question how many more years he has of really quality basketball. So what do you have in mind? Yeah, I think that 15 million a year is probably a little bit too high. For I could see three years, 30 million maybe. Uh, two years, 25 million, maybe something uh, along those lines. Um, interesting to see what he's after. Now, you mentioned the Turner Sabonis combination, just uh, some numbers on them. They played 300 minutes together during the season. They had an offensive rating of 105.6. 
and a defensive rating of 107.8. So overall, a net negative when they played in those 300 minutes. Not that it's necessarily a huge amount of um. Uh, a huge amount of uh, playing time together, but it is something that they could see work out. But of course, Sabonis was significantly more successful as a center than he was as playing as a power forward in Oklahoma City the uh, the year before that. So there is some interesting options for this team, especially with those non-guaranteed deals as we head into free, free agency. They were the 23rd ranked team in pace this season, 11th in offense, 13th in defense. So pretty strong at both areas, uh, both areas there. Didn't take a ton of threes, didn't get to the line a lot. 26th in both free throw attempt rate and three-point attempt rate, but held on to the ball well. Sixth in turnover percentage, uh, generated a lot of turnovers defensively as well. Second in generating turnovers uh, on defense, so that was uh, you know, pretty decent for them. But overall, just generally most of their team numbers sort of you know, hovering in, uh, in the middle for the majority uh, of the season. Now, of course, if we're talking Indiana Pacers, we can't start anywhere else than apart from uh, Victor Oladipo, who was absolutely sensational. Ended the season as the 10th ranked player, 75 games, 34 minutes, 23 points, 5 rebounds, 4.3 assists, 2 threes, but really the killer here, 2.3 steals, 0.8 blocks, 48 from the field, 80 from the line, 37 from three for a true shooting of 58% on a usage of 30%. Now, some of this has to be attributed to the Russell Westbrook factor, but it's not like he was this good when he was in Orlando. Now, I was big on Oladipo. I thought he really did have top 20 upside this season, last season, even the year before, but he was able to put it together with efficiency. But really, getting... And this is something that you know I've talked about ad nauseum on this podcast. If you're an old listener, you probably know what I'm going to say. But if you're a new listener, it's not all a Westbrook factor. Sure, his usage was down last season, but he also had an inexplicable 10 percentage point drop in his free throw rate. His block rate went in half. His steal rate dipped. And they're not things that Westbrook's excessive usage uh, directly correlates to. Although, Greg, I'll posit you this. I think that when you're playing with Westbrook and you're being frozen out and not used offensively, then your confidence drops in your free throws. Then your defensive uh, intensity perhaps isn't quite there. So maybe it is an indirect uh, result of the Westbrook factor that the steal rate, the block rate, both of those things doubled this season. That we saw an increase of you know, five or six percentage points on his free throws as well this year. Yeah, and the other thing too is I, I think maybe it's possible that the some way the defensive scheme of the thunder maybe moving from okc to indiana maybe that had something to do with the increase in steals but maybe there's something to it also where like you were saying you if you're uninvolved in offense it makes you a little less aggressive on both ends of the court uh but it, it's kind of hard to figure why somebody's steal rate would so dramatically increase from one year to the other year because obviously that's not really impacted by the usage rating directly and then I guess there is something to be said also for Oladipo is just a much better player this year than he's been at other points in his career. And I don't know if there's ever been a player who I've personally thought of as overrated to underrated so quickly to where I thought that people were a little too high on him at times when he was in Orlando. And then he went to the Thunder and everybody just immediately saw the numbers he put up last year and like, oh, Oladipo overrated, he sucks. And even though I my opinion on his value as a player didn't change from when he was in Orlando to when he was in OKC. I felt that my opinion of him relative to other people's opinions of him changed, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I can I can see that. So you sort of you know, held almost you know, steady on him while others sort of you know, really varied quite significantly on what his uh, value was. Now, the big question is, he was the 10th ranked player this season. Of course, this is a season where uh, Kawhi Leonard wasn't really in that mix there. Other players can take steps forward. Is he a first round player next season? Hmm. I think that's that's a tough. I don't think I would draft him in the first round because I think that there's other players that are probably a little bit safer in terms of even though I think Oladipo is going to be really good again this year. I would probably want to see it from him again to say that like, oh, I want to draft him ahead of somebody like Kawhi Leonard or ahead of uh, like Damian Lillard, who also might go towards the end of the first round. So I think I'd feel better about drafting Oladipo towards the start or the middle of the second round, but understand that I think he could have first-round value. 
Yeah, that's that's the tough thing. But I think when we're looking at these sort of things, we, we need to have a look at, at the numbers and say, well, what won't he be able to do again next season? And who are the players behind him who are going to have situations where they can jump up? So uh, a couple of the names that are behind him, Russell Westbrook, Nikola Jokic, Jim Butler, Kyrie Irving, Paul George, Joel Embiid, uh, Marshawn Brooks, clearly taking the piss there. But these are there's a bunch of guys there. You know, Jokic, Westbrook, Butler, Probably not Butler. Um, Irving, maybe. Uh, Paul George, Embiid. I think George, Embiid, Westbrook, Jokic have significant claims that they'll be at, they'll be able to jump ahead of Oladipo next season, pushing him from 10th to, say, 15th. And that would be maybe without anything that he did this season changing. But what did he do this year that you know could regress? 23 points per game? Eh, that's not fluky. Two threes, five rebounds, four assists. Totally fine with all those numbers. But the concern I have is... Do the, do the steals go from 2.3 to 1.9? Do the blocks go from 0.8 to 0.6? It seems like not much, but going from 0.8 to 0.6 is a 25% decrease, and that's a big, big deal. Does his percentage drop from 48 from the field to 46 and a half or 46? And if all those three that, things that, happen, then he goes from 10th to 21st or 22nd, and that's that's the concern. Yeah, that's for sure my biggest concern is the efficiency numbers because last year he shot almost 48% from the field. He had never shot higher than 44% in any other season. The three-point shooting has kind of steadily been increasing throughout his career, 33, 34, 35, 36, and 37% last year. So I think 37% he could probably keep that up. But I would be a little concerned that the rate that he finished around the rim and the amount that he made mid-range jump shots could regress a little bit. And there could be a pretty big difference between him shooting 48% from the field and 46% in terms of his fantasy rank. Yeah, he, he uh, finished at 69% at the rim. Giggity! Um, and that's something, yeah, and 44% on long twos, which is obviously yeah a, a really, really high uh, amount. And will that be something that's able to... um. To continue, I'm not sure. You know, 43% on all these mid ranges is obviously really, really, uh, really, really strong numbers. So there is that concern. I don't think personally I would take him in the first round. I think he will go in the top 10 in many situations. And as a result of that, outside of the dynasty leagues that I already own him in, I probably won't end up with Oladipo on any of my teams, but it's obviously really early to project that. But I, I can see him being the 17th ranked player, the 20th the 13th and that's fine for a second round guy but if you're wasting a first round pick on that i'm not sure it's necessarily the way that i would want to go and also look at his numbers like where can those improve and i look at him and go i don't actually know where they can improve can he get an extra two points per game maybe maybe he can be a 25 point per game scorer but what else is he doing five assists maybe steals not getting any higher blocks maybe i don't know i feel like when I look at all those numbers, I feel more comfortable than say, in saying they can drop a little bit rather than they will increase uh, a little bit. And that's that's my concern. And with Oladipo, as we head into uh, next season, not that it's a massive concern, of course. Now, the next highest-ranked fantasy player, many people would be surprised that it wasn't, in fact, Miles Turner. We'll get to him in a sec. It was Dazza Collison, who was the 60th-ranked player for the season. He will be 31 at the beginning of the season. He played in 69 games. Giggity! Uh, 29 minutes per game, 12.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, 5 assists, 1.5 threes, 1.3 steals, and as he always is, really efficient. A true shooting of 61, 50% from the field, and 89% from the free throw line, as well as 47% from three. And when we talk about the best three-point shooters in the NBA, Darren Collison's name never gets brought up, Greg. Um, And I think that's a little bit unfair to this bloke, because his last three years, 40%, 42%, 46% from three. You don't see many uh, three-year stretches of three-point shooting outside of Golden State at that level. Yeah, and that also kind of makes you think, what would his what would his efficiency look if he was playing on a team like Golden State, where he didn't have quite as much responsibility and was playing off the ball? So, in general, I think that Collison's probably a little bit underrated as a player. He's also had some off-court issues, which mm. has impacted, I think, how teams have approached him and the kind of contracts he's gotten and stuff like that. But when he's on the floor, Carlson, really solid fantasy producer and probably better real-life player than people are going to give him credit for. He's not the greatest defender, but that doesn't really matter too much at the point guards. But he's not bad. Um, but that shooting and that efficiency is strong. But he did see his minutes dip to 29. Corey Joseph got some of that playing time. So at this advanced age that he's getting towards, 
I'm not uh, I'm not certain that he's going to be able to maintain this level of production next season. Maybe he goes to 28 minutes per night, but I think he's a strong back-end type point guard unless things change pretty significantly in Indiana in the offseason. It's not like they're bringing in a point guard in the draft who's going to take that spot. Corey Joseph is extraordinarily limited, in my opinion. So we'll see how uh, you know th- whether they decide to go there. And Joseph's actually four years younger than Collison, so that's something to bear in mind as well. But Collison was obviously uh, really successful this year and provided a ton of value for for fantasy teams. Now, of course, we have to talk about Miles Turner, who was uh, drafted at uh, ADP 27 on Yahoo Leagues. I probably would have gone a little bit higher back end of the second round in that 20 to 24 type of zone. And he was disappointing, no doubt. 28 minutes per game only, 12.7 points he averaged, 0.93, 6.5 boards, 0.6 steals and 1.8 blocks, 48 and 79 and 36% from three. But Greg, he at this point is shaping up to be a significantly discounted player next season, despite there'll be many people listening to this who'll be like maybe hitting stop on this podcast or you know throwing their phone at a wall, man, Tono, he sucks, he's the worst, Josh, we told him, never, never again, and that's a bad, that's a bad attitude, first of all, calm down, and secondly, um, you know, ruling players from ever being owned on your fantasy team ever again takes you out of a huge market inefficiency in drafting and trade acquisitions. Yeah, and so we were talking briefly before we started this, and I was saying I think Miles Turner is going to be one of the players relative to draft position I'm going to be highest on this year. Now, we don't know that for sure because obviously we're really far out and we don't we don't know what the average draft spot's going to be on any of these guys at the start of next year, but Turner was somebody who I think we both thought was kind of like a second third round pick last year, and I think that he still has that kind of upside this year, except he's probably going to be more of a mid-round pick this upcoming year. He didn't quite make the step forward that we thought he was going to, and a lot of that had to do with looking at the stats for the Pacers last year. We were thinking like, oh, there's a ton of usage to fill with Paul George gone, and Oladipo ended up taking a lot of that role, and we thought a lot more of that was going to be Turner than ended up being Oladipo. But still, Turner's a really athletic big man. He could do a little bit of everything. He could be a good defender. He could block shots. He can make threes. So I think that there's potential for him to be a top 25, top 30 fantasy player this year. And one of the biggest issues he had, well, it was twofold. Number one, he had some injury concerns last year. So even though he played in 72 games, I don't think he was healthy for a lot of those 72. And then he also got in foul trouble a lot last year. And I think that both those things are correctable coming into this season. The big, yeah, the disappointment there with him was, of course, we assumed that he would take on an extra two to three percentage points of usage. He was at 19.8 in 16 17, and he went to 19.9. So basically, no change in his usage. And we thought with Paul George gone, he'd become option 1B to Oladipo's 1A, or or maybe the other way around. But instead, Oladipo took 30% usage, and Turner stayed at the exact same rate. In addition to that, his block rate dropped. His field goal percentage dropped. Uh, his rebound rate dropped slightly as well. And he played three fewer minutes per game, which, again, I don't think anybody could have seen coming. Hey, um, we're going to build our team around Miles Turner now. Paul George is gone. So, therefore, let's play him three fewer minutes per game. And, in part, that was to do with the struggles. He is still only young, uh, of course. And, uh, like you, I think he's going to be a guy that I'd be very, very happy to take at pick 60 or pick 70, depending on where he goes. Because he still does have that top 25 top 30 type of upside. Now, we can compare people. I oh, put play Sabonis ahead of him, and Sabonis was good this year. But I don't think that that's necessarily the way that this team should be looking. Turner did have his his struggles this year. He is a better defender than what Sabonis is, better rim protector, um, better shooter. And the team was better with him on the court versus, versus Sabonis. Now, some of that is to do with the players they were playing with, but Turner was a plus 3.8. So bonus a negative 0.8. Um, and again, you have to, you know, there's teammate factors involved there. But I do believe that Turner, as he heads in now to his fourth season, again, not an old player at all, if he gets that back to 30, 31 minutes per game, he should be able to take those steps forward. And on a per 36 minute basis, his numbers are very, very similar to what they were the year before. Slight decreases, which of course is disappointing. But I still I haven't given up faith on him. And for any of you who have got that in your head, never drafting him again, um, 
it, it, it's nonsense. It, it isn't something you should ever do. Sure, don't draft him at pick 20 or pick 25, but you're not going to have to. But this, or oh, I'm never drafting him because he sucked. Yeah, that, that's fine. He doesn't give a shit. You're not punishing him. You're punishing the only person you're, you're punishing him is a, dis, is, is a disgrace, is, is yourself. I'm reading some of the comments on the basketball um, monster forum. Yeah, his disgraceful season finally comes to an end. Like, it, it was disappointing. I wasn't. He wasn't a disgrace. He had some real stinker turds of games, but I think the hate on Miles Turner went significantly too far this season. And uh, like you, Greg, I'm uh, I'm looking for a bit of a, a bounce back from him as we head into next season. We talked about Thad Young a little bit already. He was the 82nd ranked player this year, 32 minutes per game, more than I expected him to play this season. 12 minutes, 12 not 12 minutes, 12 points. Six rebounds, 0.73s, 1.6 steals and half a block, 49 and 60. That free throw percentage, a real issue. And his, his real value comes from his ability to generate steals. And if that drops off with his athleticism, then his value is going to fall in the toilet pretty damn quickly. Is he a guy that you think is going to be a guaranteed must-draft standard league guy if he returns to Indiana? No, I really don't. And the big concern with me is the age. And then, like you said, with the steals them possibly declining if we when we look at prospects coming out of college and trying to project them to the nba one of the number one things that people look at stats to look at is steal rate in college the reason is because steals are really well correlated with athleticism and if somebody gets a lot of steals in college we would say that that's this is an athletic player who probably has the athleticism to play in the nba and so when you look at Thaddeus Young, who's a player who's really dependent on steals to be a, a fantasy relevant player, I think that 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 indicates to me that he's somebody who's not going to age well specifically for his fantasy game. Yeah, he's just turned 30 here as well, and the steal rate was it was really huge for for long periods of time. He had yeah you know, back in uh, yeah three or four years ago he was getting two steals per game. Now he's down in that one and a half steals per game uh, zone. Led the team in minutes this season as well, which is a bit of a surprise, but saw his efficiency drop as he started taking a few more threes as well. True shooting of only 53%. So while he could very well be a top 100 player again this season, I think the upside for him is limited. uh, And I'd be thinking it's more likely that he finishes outside the top 120 than inside the top 80, despite what he did uh, for this season. Now, Boyan Bogdanovich, really frustrating guy. 29 years of age, 80 games, 31 minutes, 14 points, second on the team in scoring, two threes, 3.4 rebounds, one and a half assists, 0.7 steals, 47, 88, 40% from three. Super strong percentages, really strong efficiency numbers from Boyan. But outside of the points and threes, like he just doesn't give you very much at all. And what we saw from him during the season is when Collison was out, he handled the ball more and got to the line a ton. And when you shoot the free throws at that sort of a level, that's key. And then when Dazza came back, he just went back into that more passive mode and didn't attack the rim as much, and his value dipped. He's not ever a guy that thinks he's going to become a sensational fantasy player. He's a 14-team league type of a guy, a three-point uh, points type of streaming option, but nothing else is changing with the rest of his game, is it? No, I don't think so. He's also... He's not young, so even though he's only been in the league for four years, he's still 29 years old, so it's not like he's all of a sudden going to develop anything else to his game. He's a three-point shooter. That that is what he is. If your team needs three-point shooting, he's okay to draft kind of uh, as a late-round pick. He's fine as a stream, but he's not somebody who's a lock to be in standard leagues this season. Now, his defense was pretty poor during the regular season, but to give him credit, he was quite strong defensively in the playoffs against LeBron James. He was able to hold up okay there, which is not something I thought he'd be able to do, but realistically, he can't create shots for other people or even for himself a lot of the time. Most of his shots uh, do get assisted. As a, as a wing scorer, um, 94% of his three-pointers were, were assisted as well, and 53% of his two-pointers, which is more in line with a big man than necessarily a, a creative-type wing player. But he's still going to be in that similar zone next season, but after and when his role goes to, say, 22 minutes or 23 minutes per game, his value is just not really going to be there. Demontis Sabonis, big surprise this year what he was able to do. Again, how much of a factor is the Thunder system or Russell Westbrook in terms of limiting what players can do? But Sabonis broke out, 22 years of age. He's the 144th ranked player this season in only 24 and a half minutes. 11 and a half points and seven and a half rebounds. Gave you two assists, half a steal, half a block, 51 and 75. And the big surprise here, 
not his rebounding because he was able to do that in college, but his ability to get assist was super impressive this season, something we didn't really see in OKC. But one thing that's always going to hold him back, Greg, from being an upper echelon fantasy guy, no steals, no blocks. That's the real concern that he just doesn't get those numbers generated. He can be a points and rebounds type of a guy. I'm trying to think that sort of player. That's like a, a Nikola Pekovic type of a guy, a, a points and rebounds uh, player. Adding those assists in might have some value, and he was impressive this season, but the defensive stuff is a real concern with him from a real-life perspective and also from his overall ability to impact uh, fantasy leagues. Yeah, I think the other guy whose numbers might kind of be similar to is uh, what Ke- the numbers that Kenneth Fareed put up for uh, the yeah. Nuggets when he was younger. Craig Monroe's another so one too, although he gets steals. Yeah, it, it's it's partially because the lack of athleticism the lack of length also for Sabonis doesn't get steals doesn't block the shots as you said Uh, I do think that there's a chance that we see Sabonis develop a little more this year I'm kind of surprised that he doesn't pick up more assists because just from watching the games he does seem to be a pretty capable passer but under two assists per game this year if he's going to play more alongside Turner and Oladipo this year as opposed to just kind of being a bench piece maybe playing with better players there'll be more opportunities for assists just on guys making shots off of his passes Uh, but overall I think Sabon is probably a better real life player than he is fantasy player yeah, just because of those defensive yeah, limitations that he does have. He started off, I guess, the season yeah, dishing more assists than at the end of the year that started to dip. Like he had a stretch at the beginning of the year, 5 2 2 5 6 3 3 assists. Like that's a strong stretch, but really wasn't able to get close to those heights towards the end of the year. And even playing in some big minutes down the end of the year, you know, 33 minutes against the Cavs in April, 22 5 and 2, yeah, 19 6 and 0, 10 and 5 in the last three games uh, of the playoffs there. Um, yeah. 30 and 8 against the Hornets with three assists. So some decent numbers. He is a you know, really, really strong player. And look, there's a chance that he pokes his head into the top 100 at some point in his career. I just don't think his upside is necessarily too much higher than that uh, at this stage. The advanced numbers do really uh, like him, though. You know, strong win shares numbers, good PR. The box score plus minus stuff is, is a little bit wonky uh, for Sabonis. But the overall lack of defense is probably going to end up limiting him. Corey Joseph, the 210th ranked player this season, just an absolute fantasy non-factor. Eight points, three rebounds, three assists in 27 minutes. And you can talk about Sabonis, who played three fewer minutes per game, was able to rank 70 spots higher. Even if Joseph was locked in as a starting point guard and getting 32 and nine, I don't even think I'd want him in a standard league, even at that type of a situation. Low assists, low steals, doesn't hit threes, not good efficiency, not a high usage guy. There's nothing I like about him for fantasy, even if that role changes. Yeah, and we saw him as a starter this year, and he didn't really do he didn't really do a ton in that role. He played 32 and a half minutes per game as a starter, eight and a half a point, eight and a half points, three and a half assists, four and a half rebounds, and not really too much else. Not efficient numbers. He shot 40 percent from the field as a starter, and then doesn't really get to the free throw line all that much. Doesn't make a high percentage of free throws when he gets there. So. Really, regardless of the situation Corey Joseph was to find himself in, if Collison was to get hurt and Joseph moves into the starting role, still not somebody who I would think of as like a must-add player. Lance Stevenson is a guy that if he is in a bigger role, then he is going to accumulate stats. Now, he's not good enough to be in that sort of role, but if things go awry and he is forced into a larger role, then he's going to be useful. He averaged 9, 5, and 3 in just 22 minutes per game with 0.6 steals, but he's not hitting you threes. He doesn't really generate the defensive numbers, and efficiency is a real problem, a true shooting of under 50% for Lance Stevenson. But points, rebounds, assists, if that's your game, then Lance Stevenson can produce that for you. I am a noted Lance Stevenson hater. He is one of these shittest blokes in the NBA. He's frustrating to watch. He takes poor shots on court. He's a shit bloke off the court. Um, yeah, I don't, I, look, he can provide moments and people really love to celebrate him. I hate celebrating Lance Stevenson, um, but he's a solid enough deeper league player uh, who seems to only be able to produce when he's wearing a Pacers jersey. Yeah, that's uh, that was something I was going to bring up, which I think is one of the, the weirdest things about it. Is, it is that it's so we've weird. We've seen Lance Stevenson in a lot of different jerseys. He's had a lot of opportunities, a lot of different teams. And he's been able to carve out a role in two separate stints with the Pacers as being a, a role player who can produce enough to at least be worthy of a roster spot. Outside of them, he's played on the Hornets and was not able to hold on to a roster spot. He played on the Clippers and was not able to hold on to a roster spot. The Pelicans, the Grizzlies 
the Timberwolves, and he sucked all of those places. But for whatever reason, there's something about wearing a yellow and blue jersey where it's uh, that makes him okay. Trevor Booker came across after being bought out by the Sixers. Not a lot to really talk about with Booker. Um, yeah, maybe if Thad Young leaves, they look at him as a spot starter and play more of those Sabonis Turner lineups. But I don't really think there's much for us to pay attention to with Trevor Booker. He is uh, 30 years of age already. We've talked about Al Jefferson so far, who had occasional moments, but he just can't stay on the court long enough. But one guy who was uh, had an opportunity at the start of the season with uh, Paul George leaving was Glenn Robinson the third, the little dog, but suffered an ankle injury, which was significantly severe. Only played 23 games, 4 points, 1.6 rebounds. Didn't really do enough in that time to give us a you know, massive hope. Shot 41% from three, which was solid, but returning from ankle surgery is never a good indication uh, of what that player is going to be in, in future seasons, as that ankle problem can be a, a real issue. But with the way that Bogdanovich played this season, I don't think there's much you know, scope for Robinson to really jump forward and become this you know, great option. Still only 24 years of age, so there is some hope that he can uh, become better, but you know, that's a really, really deep dynasty flyer who you know, I think has a pretty limited chance of uh, coming, coming to uh, fruition. Yeah, I think the one positive I would say about uh, Glenn Robinson 3 is that he does make threes. He shot 41% from three in his limited amount of playing time last year and overall 38% from his career. So I, I think that that means that there could be a role for him in the NBA because somebody with a little bit of athleticism that can spread the floor and make threes efficiently, there's a place for them in the league. So I, I think at least for that, he should be able to hold on to a roster spot for the next few years. One last guy that we probably should touch on, um, don't really need to talk about Joe Young or Edmund Sumner or Ike Anabogu. I don't think there's much of a future for those guys, but TJ Leaf played a considerable role early in the season, was faded out as the season progressed. 53 games, nine minutes per game, but as a rookie, shooting 43% from three is fantastic. The problem is everything else was not fantastic. Generates no steals or blocks, poor rebounder, horrendous defender, doesn't pass, yeah, bad free throw shooter, 63% for the season, albeit on only 16 attempts, but yeah, the three-point shooting was, was real. Everything else was just disappointing. He he had five steals in 54 games and four blocks in 54 games and only nine assists. So that is you know, really, really poor numbers there from TJ Leaf. I don't think that you can have him as a starting power forward on an NBA team, especially one who... You know, like the Pacers are, are thinking, hey, we're we're pushing you know, towards more here with this young core that's you know, really starting to develop with Oladipo, Turner, and Sabonis, and I don't think that Leaf can be a starter in that type of situation and not really be a big fantasy contributor because he's giving you nothing outside of threes. Yeah, I think TJ Leaf was probably one of the least impressive rookies last year, and he, he does one thing well. He seems like he could shoot threes because he shot 43% last year, shot 47% from three in college. Outside of that, I think he really doesn't add much to the floor and doesn't seem like he's athletic enough to really stick with most people on the defensive end of the court. So TJ Leaf is probably not going to ever be fantasy relevant player at any point in his career. I think that's a, I think that's a fair enough statement. You don't have any hot takes on Edmund Sumner or Ike Anabogu or Alex Poitras or Ben Moore at all? Uh, I wouldn't call this a hot take on Alex Poitras, but when he was in college at Kentucky, I thought he was going to be a really good NBA player. Yes, I am. And it's it's hard to say it was a huge miss because I think it's understandable because he did have a pretty significant ACL tear. It actually might have tore like his ACL, his MCL, and his PCL all at the same time, if I remember correctly. But, I mean, that, that's what I have to say about Poitras is there was a point in time where I thought he was going to be a really good NBA player and he looked really athletic at times in college and that kind of went away after the knee injury. And there's your Alex Poitras update for the day. Greg, thanks for coming on and discussing the Indiana Pacers. They were a massive surprise, big breakouts, big disappointments all over the place with this roster. Give us uh, another plug for all the stuff that you do and uh, I love hearing you talk about your foul balls. Yeah, definitely. So my foul balls, you guys can go to iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher. I have my own DFS podcast called Foul Balls Podcast, where I just talk about right now the baseball slates for all the weekday games. And then when basketball season, football season starts, I talk about those games as well. And then follow me on Twitter at GArenbergDFS for whatever content I put out. I always put links to it on Twitter. Yep, go and follow Greg there and follow me at redrock underscore Beeble. Subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star rating. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Greg, thanks again for coming on and recapping the Indiana Pacers.
Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, Josh. All right, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Trevor Booker.